Hi, and welcome back to U.S. History with Mr. Snyder. Today we are beginning the build-up through the 1930s to World War II. So let's go ahead and get started with today's learning targets. Um, you've got quite a few sub-targets, but don't let that deter you. Um, we're going to explain how the end of World War I and the Great Depression gives rise to these dictatorships and these militaristic regimes uh, happening in Europe and Asia in the 1930s, so that's a pretty big one. We're going to summarize the actions taken by those aggressive regimes, and we will analyze the responses of Britain, France, and the United States to those aggressive regimes. So without further ado, let's get started. The Soviet Union, remember, they had to pull out of World War I because of a civil war, and uh, Lenin was the leader, and uh, the communists eventually win. They turn from Russia into the Soviet Union, they become communist, and Lenin dies a few years later, and Joseph Stalin succeeds Lenin as a leader of the, U of the USSR, or the official name of the Soviet Union, in 1924. And Joseph Stalin... Uh, his name literally means man of steel and he still institutes communism which is public ownership of goods so people own things together it's common ownership of goods he starts to move them from an agricultural country into the second largest industrial power by 1937 he kills his own people um, there's not enough food for people, there's famine, people are starving. He kills 8 to 13 million of his own people. And nobody focuses on what he did, they only focus on what Hitler does during World War II, killing only about 6 million people. Um, he also turns the Soviet Union into a totalitarian state. Go ahead and say that out loud. Totalitarian state. I'm serious, say it out loud totalitarian state it is the single party or leader controls every aspect of a person's life what they eat how they dress where they work how much food they get how much money they get etc and here you can see some more characteristics of a totalitarian state uh, making using the media to control people and war people's minds uh, using the schools to indoctrinate students uh, all part of a totalitarian state, and these all become totalitarian states. Uh, next up, we have Italy, and Benito Mussolini uh, comes to power as head of the fascist party. And the fascist party um, basically stresses nationalism and says that everybody needs to pitch in and place the interests of the country above their own. And so it's a type of... Uh, repression that governments use uh, at the time people were willing to listen to it because of the Great Depression that was coming it hit Europe places in Europe a little bit earlier uh, the unemployment and inflation and Italy does not become communist but they are afraid of the threat of becoming communist which a lot of places were even in the United States in the 1920s uh, next up we have the big one Adolf Hitler and Germany. Adolf Hitler is the leader of Germany starting in 1933-34. Uh, he joins, the official name of it is the National Socialist German Workers Party or the Nazi Party in 1919. And uh, before that he went to jail for some crimes committed. He did fight in World War I as well. Um, and while in jail he writes kind of his autobiography or his uh, Pro his view on society, and it's called Mein Kampf, and that translates to my trouble or my struggle. Um, and it, in it, he explains things of why Germany is the way they are. He blames Jews and communists. People read this book, and they begin to believe its ideas, especially as Adolf Hitler's popularity rises. And so his idea to fix this is fascism with extreme nationalism. Everything people do should be for the state. Um, there's also racism involved in this because of the Jews and um, other people that uh, Adolf Hitler decides to attack and blame. And he wants to purify 
the German race. That is how he is going to solve a lot of its problems. And he has kind of this hierarchy. And on top are the Aryans. And the Aryans are German, and they have blonde hair and blue eyes. And so they are on top. Then are regular Germans. And then on the bottom are everybody he intends to eliminate eventually. Jews, non-whites, Slavs, Catholics, um, people with disabilities, um, people with physical disabilities and intellectual disabilities. So Hitler is definitely looking um, to the future on how to make Germany great again. Because after World War I, they were destroyed they weren't able to do anything because of the Treaty of Versailles, and they really resented that. So his goal is to expand Germany again, and he is appointed Chancellor of Germany in 1933. E Germany at the time is in an economic depression, just like the rest of the world, and people loved to see Hitler's uh, views and Hitler's uh, speeches. He was a very, very good public speaker. And like I said before, the Treaty of Versailles that Germany really resents this and they don't feel they have to follow it because they were not present in Paris when it was written after World War I. And of course Germany also has a lot of those characteristics of a totalitarian state. So next, let's go out east to Asia. Uh, Hirohito and Tojo and Japan, they become imperialistic and they start expanding. Um, and there's the Emperor Hirohito and there's the General Tojo. Um, they decide to start expanding into the Pacific because they're an island. They obviously have to start taking over other land. Their goal is to acquire more living space, more raw materials, and they believe that they are culturally and racially superior, so they should have no problem with this. And the aggressive regimes or the aggressive actions that these regimes take you can see Japan there in the map takes over the area of Chinese controlled Manchuria and they also withdraw from the League of Nations when they try to stop them so all of that yellow shaded area on the map it belongs to Japan uh, by the end of the 1930s going into World War II and then they acquire even more Germany, on the other hand, begins building up its military in violation of the Treaty of Versailles. They enter the Rhineland, which is this area in the middle between Germany and Belgium and France and Luxembourg. And it, it's resource rich. They want to get it uh, back and become a part of Germany. It was supposed to be demilitarized, but it is not anymore. And Germany also withdraws from the League of Nations when the League of Nations tries to stop them. And so the responses by other nations, Br France and Britain practice what is called appeasement. They think if they give these concessions to an enemy in order to maintain peace, that everything will be okay. But it actually causes the bully or the aggressor to become more aggressive. They should have put their foot down right away and said, no, Germany, you can't do any of this stuff. Other things, other actions that Germany takes are they, be, they bring Austria under German control as a part of the Anschluss Agreement. And they also take over the Sudetenland, which is right on the border of Czechoslovakia. And they're, what Britain and France are thinking is, well, a stronger Germany may serve as a buffer to the scary communist Soviet Union. And the U.S. response is called isolationism. We want to isolate ourselves. We don't want another World War I where Americans are sent overseas to get killed. We're too concerned with the Great Depression and the New Deal at this point. So let's just focus on what's going on at home and not even worry about what's going on in Europe. And so we show no unity with Great Britain or France in the 1930s, at least the early part of it. And that is it for this um, lesson. Make sure you filled out all of your learning targets and sub targets, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.